All right, all right. Thank you so much for clapping. <laughs> makes up for high school. <laughs> Just kidding, nothing makes up for high school. God is so good. We've had such a great, fun weekend. It's, I'm telling you all, um, next time we come, if we do any equipping or teaching, sign up to come to that. Um, we do so much prophetic ministry, and uh, like a lot of people are like, well, I want, it, uh, I want a word, and we're going to get there today. I know I've been dangling the carrot in front of your face, for those of you that have been in all three services, <laughs> um, but we're going to move into it. Amen? Okay, we'll do it in this service, but really on Friday we did a lot, and on Saturday we had a lot, and so um, come to those things. Participate in the whole weekend and get everything that God has for you. Some of you are like, well, I got a life. Well, I don't care. Come anyways. It's fun. We party hard. Amen? Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, um, this is my gorgeous wife, Grace Holter. Grace, stand up and give the people a wave. I married way out of my league, which every guy should feel. If you don't feel that way, you should, because women are better than us in a lot of ways. <laughs> okay. I, I, I could not believe she wanted to date me when I met her because I was like shipwrecked in my faith. I was totally jacked up. I had been through hell on earth. And when I met her, I was like, I was so broken and jacked up when I met her that like we started kind of being friends and I asked her out on a date, but I wasn't like, would you like to go out with me? I was like, if you'd like, you could bring several of your friends and we could go somewhere together as a group. And she's like, why would I want to do that? <laughs> We can just go ourselves, and I'm like, okay. Like, I was so broken and jacked up when I met her. And uh, her name's Grace for a reason. She's her namesake in my life. You know, I sat her down. We have opposite lives. She was a faithful girl, a strong girl, stayed faithful to the Lord her entire childhood. Like, we had opposite lives, right? Like, she was super um, sweet and faithful to God. And like I told you, when the Lord found me, I was living with a lesbian, dating a stripper witch, and dying of a drug overdose. <laughs> I worked for a drug dealer, and so, like, my life was pretty bad. We had a lot of uncommon things when we met. And so on our third date, the Lord's like, um, you need to tell her everything. And I was like, no. It's under the blood, Jesus. Right? You know those conversations? Maybe some of you are too spiritual in the room, but when you start dating somebody, you have to have those conversations. You know what I'm talking about, <laughs> where you're like, okay. What have you done, right? <laughs> Want to make sure we're on the same page. We didn't have to have that conversation because she knew I was jacked up when she met me. But the Lord said, tell her everything, everything that you would never share from a pulpit, every secret. So I sat her down and talked to her for 45 minutes, sat her on a bench in a park and told her everything, things I was embarrassed of. And she sat there crying for 20 minutes after I was done, didn't say a word. And I was like, just say you don't want to be with me. Like, it's, I get it. Like, I come with a lot of stuff. Like, you are faithful. You, de you deserve your Boaz. <laughs> Instead, you're getting the naked demonized man that became the first evangelist. Like, <laughs> you deserve a Boaz, but you're getting me. She's quiet for 20 minutes, just sitting there crying. And she looks up at me with those big brown eyes. And she said, I'm the luckiest girl in the world. And I asked her to marry me at that same spot just a few months later. So I'm a, very, I'm a very blessed man, and I count my blessings often. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray real quick, and then we're going to get into it. Cool? Mm, interesting. Okay, close your eyes. <laughs> close your eyes. <laughs> Help, Jesus. <laughs> um, Lord, I thank you that some have been fasting. <laughs> Lord, waiting for lunch. Um, Lord, they've been at all three services. Reward them, Father. Lord, just bless the people in the room. God, I pray as we uh, touch on this message today that every service you had me do a different message. And so, Lord, I thank you that this message is for this service. Lord, and I pray that the people in this room would connect and touch something eternal. Father, that as we leave here today, we would leave empowered and emboldened and healed up and a little bit more free. In your name we pray, amen. I have a dream in my heart that Christians will lead powerful lives. That's my dream, is that you would get over yourself and understand that you're anointed and that God's called you, and that you would quit waiting for other people to do your work. 
because there's people that God has set aside for you to interact with. God has set aside people at gas stations, at grocery stores, on airplanes that you were meant to impact. But if you're always looking at somebody else to do the work, you will never show up. And you are somebody's last chance. You are somebody's divine moment. All the amazing relationships we have in ministry, we speak into the lives of federal judges, state legislators, members of Congress, entrepreneurs that are, you know, Fortune 500 companies. That didn't come from pulpit ministry or from book sales. That came from me being obedient on a Tuesday afternoon at an HEB and prophesying over some guy I don't know that's like, I'm a federal judge and like starting a relationship. The guy turned out, <laughs> I prophesied over this dude at an HEB. He was a federal judge and also, he was one of the heads of the Southern Baptist Convention. So, like, doesn't believe in prophecy. Like, believes it's of the devil to believe that you can prophesy now or speak in tongues. But the Lord gave me a word of knowledge for him about what he did three nights earlier in bed when he started speaking in tongues, and it scared him, so he stopped, and that his grandson wasn't going to die from the overdose today. Like, and he was at this HEB killing time because he didn't know what to do with himself because he wasn't allowed in the hospital. So I prophesied over him. We started a friendship, and then he would call and be like, hey, this case is coming up. What's the Holy Spirit saying about it? Like, that kind of stuff happens because we're the most obedient donkey in proximity, that's what God's looking for, right? It's donkeys. Jesus is looking for somebody to ride in on. Amen? Amen. So what kind of ass are you? <laughs> are you rideable? <laughs> You're acting like one. You might as well be one for Jesus, right? <laughs> Don't believe me? Go to Facebook. You might as well turn it around. Back that thing up and let him get on. That's what he's looking for, obedience. You never know who you're sitting next to, who you're shopping next to. Who knows what doors God could open? Well, Lord, I'm disqualified because I got issues. Shut up. God picked failures in the Bible too. Amen? We're like, man, if I could just be like Moses. No, thank you. He was a murderer. He killed a guy and ran from his calling and God met him. Amen? Amen? But I'm just telling you all, the Bible's full of epic failures that got up again. That's our, that's our heritage. Amen? But I believe every Christian should lead a powerful life, but we don't. But I believe that wherever we go, demons should manifest and flee. Healings should manifest, and people should get delivered from illnesses. That we should be prophesying over people, hearing from heaven and giving hope to people, leading the lost to Christ, doing all these things. But on a large scale, we don't. Because we've made a peace treaty with normalcy. Because we've said things like, well, I've got to work today. I've got things i got to do. I've got these things, these obligations. I get it, but obligations will rob you of a promise. And I'm just telling you, we were supposed to be powerful, and the whole world is waiting for powerful Christians to show up. There's tortured people that are waiting for you to show up under an anointing. You are how God invades earth. You are how heaven invades earth. You are a mobile upper room, a walking ark of the covenant. You are a mobile portal. Amen. You are how God shows up. There's no plan B. You're it. Some of you are like, I know myself. I'm plan A. Honey, you're plan A. God literally is risking all of eternity on you. On you during your part. Well, Lord, I pray, isn't that enough? No, get your butt in the streets. Start laying hands on people. Start casting out devils, but we can't. We can't. Why can't we? Because we're not walking in power and authority. What's stopping us from moving in power and authority? The devil's got dirt on us. We got mixture in us. The thing that stops us is a lack of faith. And faith, the word tells us, is how God shows up in your life is through your faith. That's how the miraculous manifests. It's not a lottery. You're not a Christian that God's like, oh, you prayed right today, I'm going to show up. He comes to those that have faith, and that's how power invades your life. So if you're suffering, increase your faith. If you're not seeing the miracles, if you're hurting in your finances, increase the faith. And there's a work to that. God's looking for Christians that actually have faith. Not just fandom, but faith. Real faith. And you know, people that have faith have been through some crap. I got faith because I know what hell looks like. I've been through it. And my faith has increased because I came out the other side alive. 
So what stops our faith? It's the one thing that we're all contending with right now with the media, with this zombie apocalypse virus we're in. It's fear. Anxiety, worry, and fear are what's stopping us from walking in the fullness of God's power in our lives. Fear is irrational. My dad, I grew up in North Dakota. We've got lakes and rivers, okay? We have nothing to be scared of. There's no predatory animals up there. We don't have bears. We don't have anything. We have coyotes. That's about it. There's nothing to be afraid of. You go swimming in a lake in North Dakota, nothing's going to bite you. It's just fish to eat. That's it. You don't have to worry about alligators. You don't have to worry about anything. But my dad somehow has convinced himself that he can't swim. Because if he does, a shark's going to eat him. My dad's favorite movie growing up was Jaws. And now my dad's convinced himself that he's going to be in some lake or some river and some sort of like mutant river shark is going to come to life. Or he'll be in a lake and some lake shark's like, hmm, I'm alive, let's eat him. And now my parents live in Houston and go to Galveston where we actually have sharks. My dad's like, I'm not going in that water. There's a shark in there just waiting to eat me. I'm like, yeah, dad, you're so delicious. Like all the rumors in Shark Town are just like, have you ever tried Barry? I've heard he's delicious, tender. Yeah, he's like the Wagyu of people. It's delicious. He's delicious. <laughs> it was irrational fear. Even when he was young and he was swimming in a pool by himself, he'd get nervous. Now, don't laugh. You've done that too. You've been swimming in a pool by yourself. No one's in there. You're swimming towards the edge and you're like, like you speed up because you're convinced something's chasing you. You're like, oh, 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 oh. It's, it's scary to swim by yourself even in a pool. But that's what fear is. Fear is irrational. Fear doesn't fight fair. Fear is illogical. This is the definition of worry. Tell me if this sounds familiar to anybody in the room. Worry, to torment oneself with disturbing thoughts. Now that we have Google MD, everything's cancer. Right? I woke up and my hip's sore. And I Google it. It's bone cancer. Yeah. I got hip cancer. I'm going to die. You're like, oh, man, my neck hurts. Aneurysm. You're going to die. Everything's death on, on the internet. It's all death. There's a splinter. Sorry. You're going to die from it. You're going to get a blood infection. It's super rare, but it's going to happen to you. And they have these things like mystery diagnosis. Right, where somebody goes in and they're like, I've got a lump on the back of my neck. And they're like, oh, it's an entire alien baby farm. And it's going to explode in your neck and you'll die. It's super rare, but you could get it. Like, we don't need any help being scared of things. You ever have a boss come by your cubicle or your office and be like, hey, uh, can you stop by later? I need to talk to you. Instantly, you're afraid. You're like, I'm going to lose my job. My boss used to come by when I worked at Shell Oil, downtown Houston. She'd come by and be like, hey, can you come by my office? I just, I need to talk to you a little bit. Instantly, I'm a chihuahua, <laughs> shaking and peeing. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't care who you are. When you get nervous, you instantly have IBS. Instantly, you're just like, got to go poop. Like, going to happen. <laughs> I'm nervous. And we immediately start imagining the worst case scenarios. We begin to torment ourselves with disturbing thoughts. I'm going to lose my job. If I lose my job, I'm going to lose my income. If I lose my income, I'm going to lose my house. And if I lose my house, I'm going to lose my respect for my family and I'll be homeless. And if I lose my family and, my home, and I become homeless, I'm going to go back on drug addiction to make sure that I can make it in life and I'll sell drugs to make a living. Like it spirals out into craziness. And when fear enters our lives, we think crazy things. I don't got enough money to pay bills this month. Okay, well, let's take the car title down to the car title place and get a high interest loan. And we start making crazy ideas instead of trusting God with the process. We start making our own plans and we start manhandling a situation. But why do we worry? Why are we controlled by anxiety and fear? Why do we worry so much? Where did the seeds of worry come from? Unresolved disappointment. Pain in your heart that you didn't let the Lord heal. Places where you felt the sting of loss or rejection or whatever it was. We were told by doctors we'd never have a child. 
That was disappointing. But we found faith. We stood on our faith, on prophetic words we received. And we had our daughter. I'm just telling y'all, unresolved disappointment will affect your faith. Worry is the enemy of faith. That's how your faith is affected. I'm giving you a weapon this morning. My prayer is that you're not so inwardly focused on a word that you're missing yours. I'm giving you a weapon right now in your arsenal against the enemy to sharpen your faith and strengthen your faith. God needs your faith to show up. He's not going to violate your free will to not be faithful. Worry is the enemy of faith, and a lack of faith will directly affect the level of power that flows through you. I'm going to take you to Matthew 21, 18. It's where Jesus curses the fig tree. How many of you know that story? Right? It's an OG story. Jesus and his crew are going through the countryside. Jesus goes to a fig tree to eat fruit. And now in this season, it shouldn't even be bearing fruit. But Jesus draws near to the fig tree and see that there's no fruit on it. And he curses it. And he said, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. There's a whole nother message in that, by the way. It's not even supposed to bear fruit, but whenever Jesus draws near, you should bear fruit. It didn't. He cursed it. It withered. And the disciples go, how did you do that? It says they marveled and said, how did you do that to the fig tree? I'm sure Jesus is fully man and fully God, which means he's a sympathetic high priest, was tempted in every way we were tempted, and understood disappointment like we did too. He sweat blood due to stress. He understood stress and frustration. You're telling me he didn't get frustrated with the disciples sometimes? That they're like, how'd you do this? And he's like, seriously? I'm the son of God. We talked about this. <laughs> Demons and blind men can find Jesus, but the disciples couldn't. Wow, who are you? We're constantly being astounded by these things and asking how you're doing them. And he's like, I'm the son of God. Let's read it. Let's get into that scripture. Matthew 21, 18. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Talking about Jesus. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. Which in the Greek means at once. Uh, when the disciples saw it, <laughs> they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt... You will not only do what's been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. You cannot move mountains without faith. You can't wither the fig tree. You can't decree a thing without faith. You can't pray successfully for your children without faith. I'm going to help somebody in here today. We need faith. When Elijah faced the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18.25, that took faith. The prophets of Baal were saying that their God was the number one God. This was during a drought. And what happened? Elijah went to them and said, let's have a contest. And the true God will answer by fire. Most of the time, we're scared to challenge the enemy in our faith. We just don't want him to even know we're here. <laughs> we're like, if the devil just never bothered me again, I'd be fine. You're doing it wrong, if that's the case. If you're not being bothered by the enemy, honey, you ain't showing up. It means he ain't concerned about you, which should be alarming to you. So Elijah goes and says, yeah, let's do it. You have your altars. I'll have mine. And Elijah dug a big moat around the place where he was going to burn the sacrifice. And filled it with water. Water at that time was more precious than gold. Because they were in a drought. Which means your faith will cost you something. But the good news is God will show up. It's worth paying the price. So he's facing the prophets of Baal. And he goes, you know, you guys go first. So the prophets of Baal start worshiping their gods. Start crying out. They start cutting themselves. Right? They're screaming out to their gods. And Elijah starts messing with them. He's got so much faith that God's going to show up that Elijah's like, um, maybe you're not being loud enough. Maybe your God can't hear you. Literally, Elijah says, this is how it's translated, 
Maybe your God in the bath is in the bathroom and he's so loud pooping that he can't hear you. That's what it translates to. Maybe he's so loud in the bathroom that he can't hear your cries. Maybe you should cry louder because he's farting so loud. That's what Elijah's saying to the prophets of Baal. Nothing's happening. It doesn't happen. Their God doesn't show up. Elijah prays a giant cloud of fire, a funnel of fire, hits his altar, burns it up, doesn't char the rock, makes it into ash. It's, it's, you can't find it. It's totally, absolutely gone. Licks up all the water with the heat. It's all gone. God answered by fire. Imagine that, a thousand foot pillar of fire shoots out of heaven and consumes the sacrifice. And then what did Elijah do? He said, ha ha, see my God showed up. Bye guys. No. Elijah killed them all. He cut all the, all the heads off the prophets of Baal. What are you allowing to live? Can't make a peace treaty with the enemy. It doesn't work. In 2 Kings 6, 2, we read about a famine in Samaria and a victory too great to believe. There was a famine. There was an enemy nation at war. And they had choked off all the resources. No food or wine or anything could get to them. People, people were boiling their own children and eating their own children because it was so bad. The prophet spoke and said, this time tomorrow, it's all going to end, and we're going to have a bunch, like, you're going to be able to buy all the food you want. All the food that's so expensive right now will be nothing. You'll, you'll buy it for pennies. And they're like, yeah, this can't happen. And he's like, God's going to show up, and you're not going to be allowed to have any of it. You'll die because of the, your lack of faith. And there's three lepers on the outside of the gate, on the outside of the wall, wasting away, falling apart, and they go, hey, let's go to the enemy's camp and maybe they'll have mercy on us and feed us. And maybe if they don't do that, maybe they'll have mercy on us and kill us. So they go to the camp, they get to the enemy's camp and the enemy's gone. They had faith that somehow they would get delivered, but they were weak and they still had enough faith to go. The enemy was gone, but they left all their cattle all their wine, all their food, all their gold and silver, everything that they had as a pagan nation with them in war, they left because they heard thundering chariots approaching them. But it was the feet of three lepers. I'm just telling y'all, you don't have to be strong to have faith. You don't have to have it all together to have faith. Matter of fact, that's probably when you need the most faith. Those lepers didn't have it all together. Get it? I'll let that sink in over the room. <laughs> I'm not preaching anything I haven't had to live through. You understand? If I'm up here preaching about this, it means I've lived through it. Because I can't preach another person's sermon. There's no power in it. But I can give you something from something I've survived. Whatever you've, whatever you've survived, you have authority over to conquer. For other people's benefit. So when my wife and I got married, like we were still just like days after getting married. And I realized like, shoot, I never went and got my lab work done to get blood tests done because I had a different life than her. So I'm thinking I need to get tested for STDs and diseases and make sure I'm not bringing that into my marital bed, even though I'm a couple days late. <laughs> I'm depending on the Lord's graciousness. I just didn't think about it. And so I go in, get all my lab work done. Nine o'clock that night, my doctor calls me on my cell phone. Doctors don't call you on your cell phone from their personal cell phones at nine at night. And she's like, Luke? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, um, I have a question. Yes? How do you feel? What? I felt fine till you called me at nine o'clock at night and asked how I felt. Now I'm clammy and sweaty and my mouth is dry. Why are you asking me how I felt? And she's like, um, I need you to meet me at the emergency room. 
why? She's like, um, because of HIPAA laws, I can't tell you. And I'm like, so you called me to say you can't tell me why, but I need to go to the emergency room immediately. She's like, yes. And I was like, what is it? Is it cancer? And she's like, I, Luke, I can't tell you. I was like, it's AIDS, isn't it? I have AIDS, don't I? And she's like, Luke, I can't tell you. And I was like, cough twice if it's AIDS. Like, just like <laughs> trying anything to trick this woman into telling me what sickness I had. She's like, I can't tell you. Just please get here. I'm already here waiting for you to get here. And I'm like, okay. And she goes, listen, whatever you do, do not go to sleep. What? I've got nightmare on Elm Street disease? Like, what does that mean? Like, you die in your dream, you die in real life? Like, don't go to sleep. Don't go to One, two. Like, what? don't go to sleep? And I get off the phone, and my wife's like, well, what happened? And I was like, I'm dying. I'm dying. She told me I'm dying. I got to go to the hospital, and, uh, you know, don't come with me. Just let me go by myself. And I was like, and let me see what's going on. And my wife's at home crying. And so I drive there, and I'm crying, and I get there, and the doctor's like, okay, thank you for coming in. And I'm like, okay, what's the deal? And I'm, I, I've convinced myself I've got E. coli, Ebola, cancer, AIDS, everything you can have, rheumatoid arthritis, like whatever. <laughs> like, just throw it all in there. I've got it. <laughs> and she's like, um... So all your STD tests came back, and you're totally clean. You have no STDs. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. And I know I'm not the only Christian in this room that said that at one time. <laughs> Y'all acting hard up in here. Oh, bless him. No, bless yourself. <laughs> I know a thing or two. <laughs> We've all had those hostage negotiations under the dashlight of our car. Jesus, if this comes back negative, I promise I'll never... <laughs> You're adorable. So she goes, you have no STDs? And I'm like, Wait, okay, why am I here? She's like, well, your blood sugar is 780. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, do you, why am I here for that? She's like, Luke, you're a diabetic. And I was like, what? She's like, you're a diabetic. Now, all I knew about diabetes was Wilford Bramley with the must Diabetes. That guy with the mustache? Get your diabetes supplies. So like, and I was just like, that's, that's it. Just one old guy has it, and he's always on TV. <laughs> the Wilford Bramley disease. They should just change it to that. And so I'm like, I'm diabetic. And they're like, yeah, we spun your blood in this machine, and it came out looking like a pink disco ball because you have so much sugar and fat in your blood. And I was like, okay, like, how did this happen? And they're like, does it run in your family? No, it doesn't run in my family. And so she goes, the reason I told you not to go to sleep is because you would go into a coma. And I was like, oh, okay. So she gives me all the nine oral medications, two different types of insulin, a blood monitor. I don't know what any of this stuff is for. I didn't take an education class. She just gave it to me. She's like, take this medicine. She didn't tell me about low blood sugar or anything. Now, listen, in my family, I'm the baby. I got an older brother and an older sister. So I'm the baby, which means I'm the most gifted the best looking and most talented in my family. I'm the baby. So I don't call my newlywed bride when I leave the hospital. I call mama. <laughs> so I call up my mom and I'm like, mom, I got diabetes, mama. <laughs> She's like, what? I was like, mama, I got the sugars real bad, mama. <laughs> How bad? I'm like, it's so bad. She crying on the phone. She's like, baby, I love you. It's going to be okay. We'll get through this. And I'm like, thank you, mom. You know, and she's like, dad and I are here for you, boo. And I'm like, I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I get off the phone and I call my wife. And I'm already in tears because I got love from mama. And I'm like, babe, listen. I'm not coming home yet. She's like, why? And I was like, because I have a disease. And I want to tell you about it. And I don't want to come home and tell you. I want to tell you now. And I was like, so if you want to annul the marriage, I understand. Because you don't want to marry somebody with a disease. And she's like, what is it? She's all freaked out. And I was like, it's diabetes. And it's dead silence on the phone. And she starts laughing. And I'm like, are you laughing? And she's like, Luke, 
I'm Filipino. You married into a giant Filipino family. Half of my family is either diabetic or a nurse. <laughs> like, <laughs> we got you covered. <laughs> She's like, we can work through it. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, get home, dummy. <laughs> so, so I come home, and I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to take my health back. I'm going to grab the bull by the horns, and I'm going to handle this right. So I went straight to Google <laughs> to get tips on how to take care of myself. So I was like, good tips for diabetics. The first thing that pulls up says, you'll die 30 years early. <laughs> I was 30 when I got diagnosed. I was like, I've got days left. I'm already getting scared. And then I, I pull up the next article that says, they take your legs. I was like, that's part of the deal? Like some doctor's going to show up at my house? We're here for your legs. We heard you're diabetic. We need your feet. We'll just take, sorry, that's the deal. I'm like, my wife's going to be wheeling me around. I'll be half blind from diabetes with no legs. God's good. Like, <laughs> it's going to be my life. I immediately came into covenant with a spirit of fear. And you know, the first voice I heard was not God's. It was the enemy because the enemy is an opportunist. And he said, oh, no. You're sick. You got a disease. I wouldn't do that to you. Aren't you one of his boys? Don't, don't you work for him? He's going to let you get sick like this? So I started getting scared and started having panic attacks. But I didn't know that they were panic attacks. I thought I was dying every time. When I worked at Shell Oil, I was still working. The Lord called me into ministry, and I said no because I didn't want to depend on a church to meet my need. I wanted to work a job where I didn't have to depend on God because I could control it. So I get on the 246 bus to go downtown, and there was a mean old black woman that drove that bus. And she had no time for anybody. She was a sass queen. I got, nobody talked to her ever. We just shut up and, like, we'll sit down. Nobody asked her a question because you would get the hand. So I stood up on the 246 bus going downtown and said, I'm going to die. I'm dying. Like I thought I was dying because I was having a panic attack. And I got tackled. And she pulled over the bus on Highway 45 and she said, you ain't dying on my bus. I ain't got time for the paperwork. She pulled up, she said, get off my bus. They carried me off the bus and left me on the side of Highway 45 in Pasadena. And I'm, I'm like, I call my wife, I'm, I'm dying. They kicked me off the bus. I'm dying. Come get me. She's crying. She comes and gets me. She's crying and takes me to the emergency room. We come walking in. I'm dying. It's been like an hour and a half. It's like the longest death ever. Like, I'm dying. Like, we get into the ER. The nurses, like, hook me up to machines. And they're like, your, your blood pressure's a little elevated, and so is your heart rate, but you're fine. I'm like, no, I'm dying. And they're like, here, take this pill. And I took this little pill, and about 10 minutes go by. And all of a sudden, I was like, Oh, my gosh. I feel great. Every nurse that came in, I'm like, I love you. Thank you for helping me. I was stoned out of my brain. It was anxiety medicine. And they're like, you can take him home, Grace. And so she took me home, and I got home and sobered up and was like, okay, take that every time I feel scared. And I was like, I'll just be taking this nonstop. And so I went to Google, and I searched the side effects. Have you ever looked at the side effects of any medication you're on? It's insane. None of us would be medicated if we read the side effects. One of the side effects of this anxiety medicine said could forever alter your version of reality. Like, I got enough problems. I don't need to think I'm a glass of orange juice. Like, don't, don't, don't tip me. Don't tip me. Like, I don't, I got enough problems in life. So then I, I threw all my anxiety medicine in the toilet, flushed it. And then I went and I was like, you know, if my anxiety medicine has side effects, I bet you my diabetes medication has side effects too. So I go and I've convinced myself I have every side effect of every medication I'm taking, which is not mathematically possible. 
Even the super strange, like exotic ones, like if you're ever orbiting Mars and exposed to gamma radiation, you may grow a tail feather. <laughs> I'm torturing my poor wife. I'm like, please look. There's something, I feel something back there. It's, it's there. She's like, it's a tailbone, you dummy. I'm... <laughs> So I throw all my diabetes medication away. I'm like, no, I'm going to do the natural homeopathic route. I'm going to just, I'm going to go to a natural medicine doctor and I'm going to handle it. And I go into a natural medicine doctor and he does all the scans and all the stuff and like taps my forehead or whatever he did. And he's like, um, I don't have enough chromium in the world to lower your blood sugar. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, but try, here's a bunch of stuff. And he took, I took a bunch of like, heavy metals I didn't understand and wound up passing out on the floor and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm not taking those either. And I was like, I'm going to try to control my health. And a seed came into my heart again of fear. The Lord says, quit your job at Shell Oil. No. He said, quit it. I said, all right, Lord. If it's really you, then you'll book me for the next six months without me mentioning my name to anybody or self-promoting myself at all. And that's exactly what happened. I'd be at a gas station. <laughs> yeah, you're clapping. I wasn't. <laughs> Y'all enjoy that because I was not. I was, I was at a gas station and I'd start prophesying over the guy next to me. He's like, I'm a pastor of a church in Houston. Would you please, please come minister? And I'm like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> Jehovah sneaky. He like, you got me. You tricked me. <laughs> so then I told the Lord, okay, for the next six months, if it's really you, you'll do it again. And then we all got called into the office at work. And they said, hey, everybody, you're all being pink slipped today. HP bought out your contract. You're all fired. And the Lord spoke to me in the office and said, good job, Jonah. And I walked around to everybody's office and had to repent, even though they didn't understand. I had to repent for not listening to the Lord and quitting when I should have. So now I'm home with no job. Obama was in office, so he cut funding to NASA. So my wife's out of a job. So we're both jobless, depending, uh, thrown into the throngs of ministry, expecting to pay our bills, not knowing what to do. I'm freaking out all the time. I'm going and I'm praying for people that are being healed of diseases while I, on my phone, have the nearest emergency room mapped because I'm so afraid of low blood sugar and dying. Then one day, we got no money. <laughs> we're getting pink slips on our house. My wife says, I'm pregnant. What? Right. Praise the Lord. I was like, you're pregnant? She's like, I'm pregnant. And I was like, yes! Like, I'm going to be a dad. Like, even when I was a drug addict, I wanted to be a father. I'm glad I wasn't then, but, like, I knew that I was designed to be a dad. And so I was like, we're going to have a baby. So, like, we went on the whole social media blowout. We're like, the Holters are having a mixed baby! Right? We're like, I'm Norwegian and she's Filipino, so my daughter's a Norgepino. Or a Philoegian. <laughs> and we were blasting. We were so excited. I wasn't worried about, I wasn't panicking about my health anymore. It was still there, but I wasn't having panic attacks. I was, we started daydreaming about like, what's our kid going to be like? I knew we were having a girl because of the vision I had. All that stuff. It was so exciting. And man, we were ready. And we're putting it all over the internet, man. I'm preaching at a church and my phone rings and it's my wife and we have a deal that whenever she calls me when I'm up here, I answer. And it's not because I don't take this seriously. It's that she knows I'm preaching. So if she's calling me, it means there's an emergency. And she's more important than all churches I speak at combined. So I'll pick up when she calls. And she said, come home, I'm bleeding. I hang up the phone and I say, pastor, the service is yours. I got to go home. My pregnant wife is bleeding. I leave the pulpit, I get in the car, and man, it hits me. The enemy comes knocking. Man, you're going to lose that baby. How's the score go? God let you get sick. Now he's going to kill your baby. I thought your God was powerful. Isn't he all powerful? He can't keep a baby inside your wife. Didn't he knit your baby together in her womb and he can't keep her in there? You know, if you stop everything right now and worship me, I'll make you one of the number one well-respected psychics in the world and I'll keep the baby in your wife. Drove home, got home and saw that it was too late 
pregnancy was lost. And again, the enemy came. I'd never do that to you. I'd never make you feel this. Just worship me, Luke, and you'll never feel this pain again. I wasn't strong. I didn't have a big, in the name of Jesus. I, 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 I was weak and broken and hurting, and all I could say was whimper out the name of Jesus. I just went, Jesus. And just that little pathetic whimper, the enemy fled. He was gone. Now I spent time asking the Lord, okay, that night I said, we're boys. You better start talking. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up to get sick. I didn't sign up to lose my baby. And the Lord said, I'll give you an option. I can tell you right now verbatim why you lost that pregnancy. The other option is, I don't tell you, but I'll hold you until your heart's comforted. And I sat there going, it's not fair. We had dreams. We planned with you. And then he asked me this question. Am I good? Are you good? I'm sick. And my child is dead. Are you good? Yeah. You're good. I choose comfort. And the Holy Spirit said, good. Because answers don't fix pain but I can comfort you until your heart understands. And so I let him wash over me with love. We let him wash over us with understanding and comfort. We received that. We got a painting in the mail the next week from a prophetic artist that painted this picture that I hated. Nobody knew we miscarried yet. And she's like, hey, heard you're having a new baby. Here you go. It's this painting and it's all black swirls. And in the middle, it's green swirls with a little green emerald glued onto the center of the painting. And I was like, I hate this. Because we didn't have the baby. But I didn't want to throw it away because it was a prophetic painting and I didn't want to offend God. So I put it in the garage. <laughs> we were destroyed. We were hurting. We went and did a conference in San Antonio with a guy named Bob Jones and Bobby Connor. They didn't know we had miscarried. They turned around and pointed to my wife and I and said, you will conceive. A month after we miscarried is when we conceived. And I was so petrified. They said, you're pregnant again. And the doctor said, you shouldn't do that. Your wife will never carry a baby full term, they said. And they said, plus you don't get pregnant a month after miscarrying. We didn't know any of that. So now I'm petrified. My wife's getting more and more pregnant and I'm not enjoying it in the beginning because I'm scared to lose something. And the Lord said, you're afraid to love things you can't control. So I began prophesying over my wife's womb. I began prophesying and singing prophetic songs over my daughter. I began participating, even though I was still scared. Every burp or cough my wife had, I was like, are you okay? She's like, yes, leave me alone. My wife's short like me. She's shorter than I am. She's just a little thing. And she got, like, junkyard pregnant. <laughs> like, <laughs> that baby had nowhere to go but out. My wife got so pregnant, she went duck-toed like this. Yes, it was adorable. She'd walk around the house with this <laughs> cute smile on her face, lurching around this giant belly. Man, but I was so scared. Every time my wife would be laying there and making a noise, I'm like, are you okay? Every fart. I was just like, do we need to go to the hospital? She's like, no, it's gas. And pregnant women be gassy, y'all. Just comes with the turf. I was driving her nuts. <laughs> Preached at some churches that didn't pay me. We were getting pink slipped again. We were on the verge of losing our house. Both of our cars break down. It's summertime. $7,000 to repair the cars. Churches didn't pay me. She wasn't working. I wasn't working. Churches sent the checks in the mail and they never came. 
I worked for a drug dealer for seven years who had better ethics than some preachers I know. At least they did what they said. So we were in hard shape. Didn't know what to do. My wife goes, um, I think my water just broke. <laughs> this is like the eighth month, right? Like we're close to the finish line. She's like, I think my water just broke at 11, 11 p.m. And I was like, what do we do? She's like, I don't know. I was like, Google it. <laughs> so, and I was like, I guess it doesn't stop. Let's wrap a towel around you like a big diaper and let's take you to the hospital. My wife was so afraid to give birth because well-meaning Christian women shared their horror stories and you got some horror stories. Some ladies in this house are like, I just want you to know how much I worked, how hard it was to have a baby. So they'd like tell her like, oh no, birth is beautiful. It's amazing. Imagine like 20 demons inside of you and they're all trying to come out at once through the same hole. <laughs> what? I was in labor for 32 days. It was amazing. <laughs> Pregnant for nine years. It was amazing. It's worth it. Everything swelled. I couldn't fit through a door. I died nine times during birth. It was amazing. Like sharing these stories. I'm like, my whole body split in half. I became twins. It was amazing. And both my twins gave birth to twins. And it was all like these crazy stories that my wife was petrified. She was so scared. And there's this sweet, <laughs> he's like an 80 year old dairy farmer that's a preacher that's friends with us. And he calls me and he's like, Brother Luke. And I'm like, Yeah. He's like, the Lord spoke to me about your wife. Okay. The Lord told me she's scared to give birth. And I was like, yeah, she is, Pastor. And he goes, well, whenever one of my cows <laughs> has trouble giving birth, I'll go to that cow and I'll lay hands on it and I'll pray for that cow to have a lubed up birth canal. So I've been praying personally that your wife would be lubed up. Matter of fact, this morning the church met. And we metaphorically laid hands on a cow and called it your wife. And commanded that its birth canal be lubed up. And I'm like, you're 80, quit saying lubed up. Like at any moment you could stop. <laughs> My wife pushed for 20 minutes and our daughter was born. Like, and it was fast. It was like a slip and slide. Like, you know it's fast when the nurses are like, Oh, crap. Like, like, that's, that's fast, right? Like, that. <laughs> My little girl's crying. She's screaming. Now, it's such a surreal moment when the baby's out of the womb for the first time because it was protected for nine months. It wasn't exposed to the elements or any of those. Didn't have to work hard to breathe and do all that stuff. And now it's out of the element and into a new element. So they cut the cord and like brought my daughter over to clean her up and take her foot impressions. And they're like, Daddy, come over here. And I'm like, I'm a dad. And like I floated over to the table where she was. And I'm like, I'm a dad. And, like, and I'm looking at her and this feeling washes over me. And I'm like, I want to do whatever it takes to protect her for the rest of her life. I would die for her. I would burn down the planet to protect her. And like all these feelings rushed over my heart. And I didn't know what to do because she's so little and she doesn't understand anything and she's scared and crying. So I put my finger in her hand and she wrapped those little fingers around my, around my finger and, and, and I said, it's okay, baby. Daddy's here. I love you. It's okay. And she goes, ah. Stops crying and turns and looks at me. And all the nurses go, did you talk to her in the womb? And I said, every night I talked to her in the womb. And they said, she recognizes your voice. That's why she stopped crying. She knew that she was safe now because she heard your voice. And the Lord said, that's what I want to do with you. You're scared. 
you're anxious, you're hurting, but my voice will remind you that I'm here to walk through it with you. So we take the baby home. You always feel like you're doing something illegal when you take the baby home. Because right? you're like, there's no nurses here. I don't know. What to... And I wouldn't let go of my daughter for three days. I was so afraid she was going to die. And I knew my heart couldn't take it. I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't eat. My poor wife's like, give me my baby. And I'm like, no. My precious. You know, I'm like, she's, she's ours. We want her. You know, like. She finally called my sister over, <laughs> my big sister. She comes over, and she's like, Lukey, can I, can I hold the baby? And I'm like, okay, for one second, right? So I hand her Gemma, and as soon as I feel the weight of my baby leave my arms, I'm like, <clears throat> like, just like out like a light, slept for like two days on the sofa. I was so afraid. We're home now with a newborn, got no money, we're negative $2,000 in the bank because all of our bills were auto-drafted. So we're, we need $2,000 just to get back to zero. We're behind in payment. We're going to lose our house. We have two cars that cost seven grand to fix. Neither of them work. Yeah, ministry's awesome. <laughs> we're like, this is great. <laughs> Everything's falling apart, God. And I'm in the bathroom and my wife's in bed holding this crying newborn. And my wife's crying because she's got the baby blues. So she's crying. My daughter's crying. I'm in the bathroom crying. I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm like, I, I like it that when we get intense with the Lord, we go old, old English, right? Like when you really mean it, you're like, how dost thou pardon all these iniquities unto thine? Freeth me, my Lord, unto those Abraham's bosom. Like we just start throwing it all out there. We're like, anything old English, God, you'll show up. And I'm like, why hast thou forsaken me, my Lord? I turned English, I guess, all of a sudden. <laughs> and I'm crying, and I'm looking into the mirror, talking to God. And a voice speaks to me in the bathroom and says this, give up. No. Surrender. No, you let me get sick. Surrender. You let my baby die. Surrender. We're broke. We're losing everything because of you. Surrender, Luke. And it hit me. I couldn't stop myself from getting diabetes. All I could do now is be responsible with my health and make the right choices and contend for healing. I couldn't keep my baby and my wife. All I could do is pray and be diligent with the one I have. I couldn't keep my finances in order. All I could do was trust the Lord to provide. I could fix nothing in my own strength. And that's what hit me. All my worry, all my anxiety, all my fear caused me to go into control, which is witchcraft. And he couldn't bless witchcraft. The Lord said, repent, and I repented right there in the bathroom in that mirror. The moment I repented, my phone went off with an email notification. Somebody just donated $10,000 to your ministry. I immediately start ugly face crying, right? And I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like I show my wife, I'm like, what happened? Look at him. Like, I can't even talk. I'm crying so hard. And the Lord said, I didn't do that because you cried. I did it because you repented. I didn't even do it because you were miserable. I did it because you repented. You got it. You broke your agreement with fear and worry. The Lord said, I actually had this for you eight months ago, but you wouldn't get out of your own way. He said, I had provision for you eight months ago, baby. Trust me in this process. So we were able to get our bank account back to zero. We had $7,000 worth of damage that we needed to do, that we needed to get repaired to the cars. So he took it to the mechanic, and the mechanic's like, hey, um, my father and I own our mechanic shop, and we love your ministry. They knew who I was. And they said, so we're going to fix both your cars for free. The Lord wound up 
working on our behalf to where we didn't lose our house. We were able to sell it instead of foreclose on it. And so we moved in with our in-laws. <laughs> which is actually great. I love being married into a giant Filipino family. Being married into a family that can at one turn call you fat and the next kiss you. It's pretty great. But God showed up in miraculous ways. But it's about surrender. Matthew 6.25 says, Do not be anxious. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? That's what I was trying to do. I was trying to control my health because I didn't trust God to measure my days. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We see that faith word again. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Worry is attached to materialism. Which is attached to poverty. Worry is attached to entitlement. I'm owed this. Which is attached to poverty. A spirit of wealth is what breaks that. So I did come to you as a physician today. I came to you as a doctor. I came to you as a pharmacist. And I'm about to give you a prescription. And I promise you there's no negative side effects. Only good ones. Amen? Your prescription today is Philippians 4, 6. It's your answer to worry. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The two areas under attack when you have worry and anxiety are your hearts and your minds, because you feel crazy things and you think crazy things. That's why we need the peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, this is a compound prescription, so we're going to have to mix it up a bit, okay? We're going to mix it up. Here's the three parts to the compound. One, it says, how many of you know it's important to know what the Bible says? Not just reading it, but do, do yourself a favor and do a word study. Get into the original Hebrew. Get into the original Greek. Break it down. It opens up the Bible like a blooming flower when you start doing word studies. So it says, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. The word prayer there in the Greek means worship. When anxiety hits your life, don't let that breed more fear. Put on some worship music. Begin looking at the Father. Begin worshiping the Father. It's hard to be controlled by fear, worry, and anxiety when you're praising God, when you're lifting up the greatness of God. He invades our lives that way. Number two is supplication, which is petitioning prayers, which means to have an assassin-like focus on what you're praying about. It's not lazy prayers being like, Lord, bless the neighbor, bless me too. Bless. It's you saying, I, I command in the name of Jesus that this diabetes would come under the authority of the word of God. It's coming into alignment with focus, focused prayer. So worship and prayer. And the third and most important compound to this prescription is thanksgiving. I should have been thankful I had a house to lose. I should have been thankful I had two cars that could break down. I should have been thankful I could have a wife that would even walk through loss with me. I wasn't thankful for anything I had because I was spoiled on good things. And once it all started falling apart, I felt picked on. I'll tell you what will cure that, world missions. But the Lord showed me it's a spirit of thanksgiving. And thanksgiving brings a spirit of wealth, which is not just finances. It's peace, joy, health, wholeness. It's the whole thing. Total sozo. Amen? If I could have the worship team come up to play something in a minor chord so people cry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanksgiving is the key for breaking worry off of your life. A thankful heart breaks off entitlement. 
And entitlement comes from disappointment. Places we felt dropped by the Lord or by others. I want you to close your eyes. If you're out there this morning and you're saying, you know what, Dr. Luke, I am dealing with anxiety and worry. We're living in a time where people tell you, if you sneeze, you'll die. I had COVID and they told me I was diabetic and to go home and make a will. That's what they told me. They said, go home, make a will. I went home, prayed, was quarantined and positive for 21 days and got COVID pneumonia in my lungs. And they were all telling me, you're gonna not make it, you're gonna die. And then I had another person reach out to me and connect me with a doctor who was willing to treat me. Her name is Dr. Stella Emanuel. And I went to her clinic in Houston. Man, and she pumped me full of hydrochloroquine and some other stuff. And in two days, I was right as rain. Two days, I was right as rain. Going for walks, working it out of my system. Now I am fully inoculated to the virus. Like because I travel, I get tested every month where they do my labs to test all my antibodies. Your antibodies are from navy blue to light blue, meaning light blue, meaning you're almost out of antibodies. Mine was last September is when I had the virus. I'm still dark, dark navy blue in my antibodies. I'm just, I'm not telling you to be foolish and I'm not telling you things aren't real. I've lost people I love from this virus. It's real. But we should not live in fear of anything but God. We need to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. Amen? Don't make it political. Make it smart. Amen? I don't know how we politicize so many stupid things in my life. But I want you to close your eyes. This is your opportunity to press delete today, to break your agreement with anxiety and worry. If you're in here this morning and you're saying, you know what, I do deal with anxiety and worry. There's some form of worry in my life that's affecting my quality of life. I'm not talking about you're worried about that sale being over at the mall. I'm talking about something that's dramatically impacting the way you live and even robbing you of joy. And I'll tell you, the true disease wasn't diabetes, it was worry because that spread like cancer to everything I loved. And today in a culture where people are bound by anxiety and PTSD, God's offering you the olive branch. If you're in here this morning and you're dealing with worry and anxiety and you wanna be free, just lift your hand right where you're seated. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lift them up, yeah. No shoulder highs, let's see them. Be brave about it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You can all put your hands down. A ton of hands went up all across this room and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and I want you to repeat after me as I lead you in this prayer. And this is a prayer that you can use as good medicine. Whenever the enemy brings up worry and anxiety again, you can call upon this prayer and call upon the Lord. With every head bowed and eye closed, I want you to repeat after me. In the name of Jesus, I break my agreement with worry. I break my agreement with anxiety. I break my agreement with fear. And I make a new agreement with Jesus to receive your peace that my heart and my mind will know your peace. I refuse to give in to worry. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen. God's omniscient, omnipresent, the God that was created, uncreated God outside of time, he's powerful, but he still won't violate your free will to make agreements with the enemy. So as it comes to you again, and it will, it will knock on your door again. Oh, be worried, be worried. As it knocks at your door again, no, in the name of Jesus, I make an agreement with faith. Some of you are gonna start operating at a new level of faith as you turn down fear. And you're gonna see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Amen.